I remember the first time I met you, I was 13. And I was just a kid back then, but at the time I was hurting. And dad preached a sermon about how you were the anchor of our souls from the book of Hebrews. I remember closing my eyes that morning and I promised I could see you. And you were calling me to come home with open arms like you were in love with me. And when I got up and came forward, the weight on my shoulders fell off suddenly. And I found out what it means to be set free church was packed that day but I swear it was just you and me and at that altar I prayed that you would forgive me I had been living for the world and it had left me empty and you whispered in my ear and you called me son you told me at that second that you had forgotten every bad thing that I'd done I found the answers I'd been searching for until this day it's your glory that I'm burning for and I just want to thank you, Jesus, for the sanctification process that's possible through salvation, which comes from your sacrifice. I was dead, but you gave me life. And you gave me purpose. You gave me sonship when the world called me worthless. And you made me a man when I was surrounded by boys as my peers. You advanced me in years. And you gave me a heart for the hurting. And you give the hurting a heart. You put back together what the world had torn apart. You told me that I was worth the cross and the price you paid. Thousands of revivals later and I can't wrap my mind around the lives you've saved. You are everything to me. And I can't live without you. And I want to be a voice of reassurance to the people who doubt you. And I want to stand up and fight back when people down you. I was at my lowest in life when I found you. Or maybe you found me. Either way, I know at that moment that I was drowning. I was depressed and I was angry. Teachers and preachers did everything they could to tame me. And then you brought that queen into my life named Jamie. And we started following Jesus together. And I pray, God, you continue to lead us forever. And I pray you use these hands I have and you fashion them for battle. You made me to ride into the fight strapped up in this saddle. And on this white horse, I will ride into this fight. And I will spark up this torch and illuminate the light. And you will disseminate your might. I believe, God, you'll eliminate the bite, and the snares of Satan will not touch me. And although a thousand on each side will continue to rush me, I hear your voice as you cry out, trust me, and I trust you, Lord, and I'll run this marathon, and you promise to carry me on, and I hope one day my family finds a mountain to bury me on, because I never stayed at the bottom, I climbed to the top, and I nearly died when I dropped. But you picked me up and you pushed me on And I stood up and fought back against every demon that took me on And my God is great and my God is good And His goodness is never ending This isn't hoping and wishing that I'm sending This is all that I have, my God is my dad And I will fight for His name until they put me in the grave I'm another both preparing for warfare in this cave So bring us your giants and bring us your spears The perfect love of our general cast out all fears We aren't afraid of the devil or the arrows you've planned we're confident in battle because no weapon formed against us will ever stand. Amen, huh? Yeah. 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 And the song we have to try to take breaths for him. <laughs> so yeah. What would it be like to have that passion? I, uh, I uh, reformed everything that I had to, to share with you today because the Lord was putting something on my heart and and when I when I saw this uh, this spoken word I just started thinking not really what he's saying because what he's saying is powerful if you can slow it down and catch half of it uh, it's powerful but what we lack is the passion that he has as a church, as a person. And some of us look at that and we're like, yeah, but Craig, that's just not for me. That's for somebody else. I'm not, I'm not created for that passion, but you are created for that. You are created to, to, to love the Lord with everything that you are. You are called to have this passion and this enthusiasm for God, for the church, for his people. And, and, and I love some of the things that he was saying because what he was trying to tell us is there is nothing that should hold us back from moving forward with what God has for us. Amen? Amen? 
So then it got me starting to think. So why not? What grips us and holds us back? And so today, I, I, I have a, I just sat down last night, and I just started writing down some concepts, some things that I started seeing in life, and some things that I, I, I've had many conversations over people over long periods of time, and, and I just started writing some things down, and today, I, I want to just kind of share them with you, if that's okay. And, well, I hope it's okay, because <laughs> you can either walk out or listen. <laughs> But the reality becomes like for us today is I just want us to kind of start getting a grip on what Christianity is. Who is Christ? What does it mean to be a follower? We're in this series called Unbound. And the whole concept is to stop letting the world bind us together. Stop letting the world bind us and hold us down. Because unbound means to be set free. And we say that we're set free in Christ, but the problem is we still feel trapped. So there's got to be something that's holding us back from God. Did that, are you, yes, we're walking? So today I just kind of want to go through some of this stuff and just see where we're at. So I'm asking, here's the thing, I'm not pointing a finger today. I'm just sharing some things that I've seen. Now if it falls into a category and you're sitting there going, Craig, you're condemning me. No, that's not what I'm doing, but the Lord might be. And that's real, because that's what the Holy Spirit does. Some people think that the Holy Spirit and Jesus are these like sunshine, rainbows, and unicorns, you know what I mean? And it's like magic fairy dust everywhere. And the reality becomes, that's not it. Sometimes the Holy Spirit shows up, and when he shows up, he condemns, and he, he really gets you to, and he convicts your life. Now some of you guys are saying, oh, Craig, the Lord doesn't condemn. Yes, he does. Some of you, everybody's favorite verse, John uh, chapter 3. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son. Right? But then we never go to verse 17. Or 18. Because you keep reading, it says if you don't believe in him, then you're already condemned. Now you will be condemned. You already stand condemned. If you don't believe in him. Yeah? Okay, I didn't want to hurt anybody, but that's this way. <laughs> so I just want to pray real quick, and then I'm just going to go into this. And uh, I hope it makes sense at the end of the day. And PowerPoint people, good luck. All right, so. Uh, uh, Father, uh, Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for your unconditional love for us. Thank you, God, that we are um, brought into your kingdom, that you have adopted us into your kingdom, and that we are not off someplace trying to fight for our freedom, but, God, that you love us unconditionally, and that, God, you, you call us to you. So, God, I just want to say thank you. And God, as we get into this, I just ask, Lord, that, um, that our hearts and our minds will be open to what you have. This is what we ask. And all the agree, said? Amen. Amen. So here goes my first concept. Bam! Let's see if this works. Um, if we are trying to become fully devoted followers of Christ, what holds us back? That's going to be the main question. Today. This is the one thing that I thought about. Why don't we have this passion? Why don't we have this drive? Um, especially if we have that salvation um, uh, that, that, that the spoken word was talking about. How come we don't move forward in it? What holds us back? And the key word that I think we find there is one that we talked about last week is devoted. Devotion means to with enthusiasm, with passion. If you're devoted to something, there's enthusiasm, there's passion. With something. Now, some of you guys, you're very devoted to sports teams. You know, some of you guys, I mean, it's just, and you can pick whatever sport you want, but you are fully devoted into sports teams or to certain sports because you're sitting there, I mean, and you get mad. Your team's like bad, or they're doing, or they did, like, you know, they lost or something like that, and you're like, I can't believe that. You're like mad at your kids, you're mad at your wife, you're, you're mad the next day when you go into work, and then you want to talk about it. Now, see, girls and sisters, you guys need to talk about things. <laughs> they do. They talk. Most of the things they can talk about is why LeBron did this instead of doing that, or why did Curry do this instead of, you know what I mean? The, the, in case you're the one that's going on right now. Okay. So, but do you get what I'm saying? We're devoted to so many other things, but how, are we, how can we get more devoted to God? How can we get more devoted to who our Savior is? And let's just be real. Well, why are we fighting to be devoted to our eternity? Because that's literally what we're talking about. 
We're only here for just a short amount of time. But we have eternity at stake, and yet we'd be more willing to be devoted to something else for a short time instead of devoted to God for eternity. Did that end? No, no, no. All right, next thing. So these are the concepts that I have. In my head, I broke down three types of people. And I, I believe there's three types of, of Christians, okay? And some of you are like, okay, there's lots of denominations. No, but I break it down into three categories, okay? The follower, the hypocrites, and the humanist God. Okay? The follower is an easy one, right? Let me just, this is how I define the follower. Those that follow God's word and do their best day after day to develop their relationship with God by devoting themselves to his word, the church, their neighbors, and prayer. Acts 2.42. In case you were wondering, that's exactly what it is. It's what we talked about last week, so I don't want to spend too much time like going into this, but those are the followers where you look at them and you just realize they have this passion, they have this enthusiasm, they have this love for just the, the word of God. They have a passion for church. They have a passion for the people that they live around and, and interact with daily. And they have a passion to talk with God constantly. Some of them are the crazy ones that just walk down the street and talk to themselves. <laughs> and you're like, don't talk to them. And then they go, you want to know Jesus? And you're like, no, I don't know your God. Oh, <laughs> So, but the reality is, you might not know his God because you don't know him. So, the reality becomes, we need to figure that stuff out. So, that, the, the, the follower, I think we get. I think we understand that. I think the hard part is, is actually doing that. Does that make sense? So, because we can't be fully devoted, we have to figure out other ways. And this is where the breakdown happens. This is where you get the other two markers, or the other two people that I saw. Because if you can't be the follower, but you know that there's a God, then you have to do something different. And so this is where I came up with the next one, the hypocrite, is this. Those that are stuck in the ways of the world, they hear about God and accept Him, but aren't convinced enough to actually change our or their lifestyle and habits. They are the ones that get just enough God to make themselves miserable. Some of you are like, mm, uh oh. Because the reality is, and, and let's just be real. If I ask the question here, how many of you are a hypocrite? Nobody raising their hand. <laughs> how many of you are fully devoted followers? I am! Like, you know what I mean? Everybody's raising their hand. But the problem is, when you start defining it like this, you have to actually really start looking into your life and asking the question. God, do I know you as much as I think that I do? Or am I literally stuck in the ways of the world and I just got to try to fit things in? So you look at your life and you're like, man, I'm miserable all the time. And the reason you're miserable all the time is because you have one foot in the world, one foot in the church, and you can't justify both because you either have to get rid of one, does that make sense, and accept the other. But you know there's a God, but you really like this stuff in the world. Yeah, it's called a sacrifice to get rid of it. Because I guarantee if you get rid of the worldly stuff, you will actually enjoy the church stuff a heck of a lot better. And the problem is, is when we start talking about doing like three hours worth of prayer, you sitting back and you're like, dude, I do three minutes worth of prayer. And I'm like, duh. Does that make sense? How do you do three hours of prayer? Well, not, the reality is, is you get devoted, you get enthusiastic, you get excited about it. And you just keep moving into that stuff. But let's just be real. If you have your way in the world and you have your way in the church, when you hear about a three-hour prayer meeting, you're sitting there going, but there's other things I need and want to do. Are you guess? You want them. So there just becomes this concept. It's the hypocrite. And there was this third person. Because I think, I think they're not hypocrites. They, they jump it and they, they become something else. And I call it the humanistic God. It's a God that actually doesn't exist. It's the God that they've created in their mind that is like the God of the scriptures, but actually is not the God of the scriptures. Did, this, did, that, did that make sense? So I call the humanist a God. Why? Because these are the people um, that believe God was created in our image for their will or my will to be done. These people can't justify God's word with their lifestyle, so they manipulate and twist the scripture to appease their own theology to mask their behavior or motives behind what seems to be godly front. I know that was a lot. One more time, and I'll just kind of just connect it real quick. 
It's about me. And God has to fit into my bubble and to my worldviews. And if God does not fit into my worldviews, then that God doesn't exist. Did that make sense? The problem is, it's actually the exact opposite. We're supposed to fit in with God's worldviews. We're supposed to fit in with what God is supposed to say. Now here's the thing. I know as I'm preaching this, like this is not going to make people happy. I'm actually literally looking at it and saying, I need us to really start to question who we are. Because if nobody's going to say it, I might as well say it because somebody has to. And the reality is, is I think this is where most of us live. Not us in the room, but I'm talking about the world. The world lives in a place where God can't make me happy. The, the humanist God is the person that sits back and says, oh, I don't want to outcast anybody, so therefore all roads lead to heaven. Does that make sense? Why? Because I can't outcast anybody. This is also the one that has a big problem against what the scripture actually says about certain issues that we're not allowed to talk about because they're hot button issues. And if we start talking about them, people might leave my church because they don't really, do you get what I'm saying? And the reality is, it's cut and dry. The scriptures say it. God says it. It's, it's, that's the way it is. The problem is, is because you have a certain viewpoint, you try to fit God into your own viewpoint. Are you with me on this one? So here's the thing with these people, and I just thought this was uh, interesting. Um, they said they think they found a loophole by doing this. Let's just be real. They found a loophole. Okay, they're like, oh, God forgives everything, so therefore there's loopholes in the scriptures, so there's a loophole. But if they, if they could step back for and remove themselves for a moment, they would realize they're just like Satan. They're like, well, dang, Craig, that's a little harsh. <laughs> But I can prove it with the scripture. Remember, Jesus in the desert? Satan decides to come and test him. Man can't live on bread alone. Go ahead and jump off the, the, the temple mount. The angels will catch you. The last one, hey, you just bow down to me. I'll give you everything that you want. Is this not like a humanist thought process? I'm trying to manipulate scripture to get what I want. Does this make sense? Okay. Uh, these people usually break from the church and create cults. These are what these type of people do. It's because the scripture doesn't fit into their, their thought process or their theology. So what happens is they usually break from the church. They say all church is bad. And they usually go and create another church and say this is the right church. Does this make sense? And what happens from there is now Christianity gets completely muddy. Because we have things that look like Christianity, but are not Christianity. Does that make sense? Um, I'll give you just a snippet, and, and I, 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 I love a lot of people, so don't, don't hear me. I'm not going against anybody, but I just want to be real. One of those cults and one of those things is like Mormonism, if we can. Okay? Mormonism, if you go to a Mormon and talk to them about Christianity, almost every single Mormon will say, oh, that's, I'm a Christian too. The problem is, if they're a Christian too, then I'm a Mormon. And so when I tell them, well, if you're a Christian, I'm a Mormon, they get completely offended. So somewhere there's a disconnect. You either are like me or you're not like me. Does that make sense? I'm using this as an example because I've had this conversation many, many times. Matter of fact, if you ever have like a Mormon come to your door and stuff like that, ask them if they're a Christian. They'll say yes. They'll say, if you're a Christian, then I'm a Mormon. And they'll say, no, you're not. And there's a disconnect somewhere. Does that make sense? And so, um, there needs, then, then, you know, then you can lead into the conversation. Well, then you're not a Christian, so let's have this conversation. And then however many hours you want to spend. Uh, <laughs> good luck. Uh, but the reality is that we need to make sure that we are loving and we're taking care of as well. You want to do things in love, okay? So here's the thing. I had these three people in mind. Uh, you know, just the follower, this, the hypocrites, and these people that just have this humanistic view of God. Are you guys with me on this one? And I started thinking, well, how do we get so lost? How do I turn in? How do I look at the scripture, accept God, know that he's real, look at the scripture and say, eh, I'm going this direction. How does that actually occur? So I was praying really hard last night and beating my head against my desk and saying, I don't understand. How do we get from point A to point B so fast? I get that we're involved, but how, God? And he gave me these three questions. 
And uh, the three questions that I've asked many, many times before in the past and in church and all this kind of stuff, but the three questions I kind of want to get into. Is that okay? Because if we're going to, you've got to figure out which one are you, okay? Not question. Which person are you? Are you the fully devoted follower? Are you a hypocrite that says that you're a Christian but not living it? Are you the humanist, or do you have a humanist view of God where you're thinking that all things are going to work out to your benefit, to your good? Does this make sense? Now, some of you guys will twist the scripture right now and be like, Craig, it will, because I'm going to go to heaven. Okay, I get it. And that, that is your benefit. But at the end of the day, when God asks you to do things, I think of Stephen, the very first martyr. You know? People are throwing rocks on top of him and beating him. And he's sitting there going, God, I love you. And he's singing. And his last thing is he says, I see the heavens open up and I see the Father, or I see the Son sitting at the right hand of the Father. And he gets so mad they crush his head. The first Christian martyr. Acts chapter 8, 7. Just read the whole book instead. Uh, <laughs> uh, but did you, are you guys following me on this one? That is not for my benefit. Paul walking around getting beaten everywhere he goes and thrown into prison, I'm pretty sure it's not in his benefit. I'm sure he's not walking around going, yippee, going back to prison. You know? That's not what he is. And he has many times to escape, many times. Like doors fly open randomly. He's like, oh no. I'm supposed to stay here. Does that make sense? So Christianity, like when we accept God, it's because we know God's God. And we got to follow what God is doing. And it doesn't always work out to our benefit. But are you okay with that because of who God is? That's the question you have to ask and be okay with. You guys, yeah? Are we okay? Can I keep moving? Are we touching like the subject? Like, are we... Yeah, I'm quiet, so I got scared. So here was my first question. If we're going to figure out where did we turn wrong, how do I become a fully devoted follower and not these other things? then we have to start asking ourselves these questions. The first one is this. Um, what were you expecting? When you accepted Christianity, when you heard about Jesus Christ, when you heard about God and you heard about church, there's all of us at some point, we, we heard about this and we had an expectation. This is, I, yes? You had an expectation. Something's going to happen. Like, and I, and listen, I, I, I to, I've, been, I've heard so many sermons. Um, if you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, things get better. You know, like all of the 90s. Every sermon in the 90s and early 2000s before 9-11, it was, if you accept Jesus Christ, your life's going to get way better. It was like the happy-go-lucky Jesus, okay? And, and it was like, so when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and your whole family started falling apart, and you lost your job, what's the first thing you say? Forgive you, God. What's the matter with you? I thought this was, I, my life was supposed to be better. You know? My dad has a great story about him. You, I, I, his testimony is the best, by the way, in case you guys ever wanted to hear it. He kind of looks like me, okay? This is his ball. But the reality is, they did. They sat down, my, their, their story just snippet is like my dad had like the big truck, the boat, and like an odyssey and jet skis, and they were all painted to match the same. So when they were all hooked together, it was like, oh, you know what I mean? It was like golden, right? And they, they got they were they were gonna take the they were we were going on a family trip to the river. I was like really young. I don't even think my little brother was born yet. Um, or even a thought for that matter. Um, uh, but literally like when they when they, they they literally got on their knees and they accepted Jesus Christ in, in the living room of the home. And they loaded up the truck and they went out to the river. And the boat caught fire and jet skis sunk. The, 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 <laughs> you know, and the, the, the tires of the truck popped and the air conditioner and the toilet didn't work in the room. And my older brother got heat stroke. Everything's getting better. And I'm not joking, my dad literally, he just, the guy that kind of helped him like find Christ was a, was, a work, was, a, was a friend of his at work. He literally went back to work on Monday. He was like, is there something you forgot to tell me? <laughs> like, he was mad. But you know what? Like, this, is, this is it. This is this not how we view? We have an expectation. When other expectations don't work, we get upset. And we can't justify who God is Versus what I expect him to be. Does that make sense? 
Larry Craig, these are all good examples. Where's the Bible? I'm glad you asked him. You know. <laughs> Luke chapter 7, John the Baptist is in prison, and he's about to get his head chopped off. And so he asked the question, John, uh, so John called two of his disciples and he sent them to the, uh, to the Lord, Jesus, to ask him, are you the Messiah we've been expecting or should, we be, or should we keep looking for somebody else? Now when you read that and you don't know the context, you think that this is just a really nice statement. Does that make sense? And then the, the disciples show up and they say, John's two disciples found Jesus and said it. John the Baptist sent us to ask you, are you the, basically, are you the one that is to come or should we be expecting another? Why is he asking this question? Because John's in a prison cell about to get his head chopped off and he will be no more. And Jesus is walking around setting people free, setting the campus free, healing people, doing all these things. And John the Baptist ain't getting none of that favor. Are you guys with me on this one? If you're the one that is to come, why am I still sitting in jail? Why am I about to die? And he basically tells his disciples to go back and tell them, I am the one that is to come because of all these things, and you know that I am, but blessed is the one that does not get offended by me. Are you getting this scripture yet? You see, John the Baptist had an expectation of what Jesus was supposed to do in his life. And when it doesn't match up, he has to ask the question, are you the one that is to come or should we expect another? And let's just be real. In atheism today, this is the biggest thing that they have to, over, they have to jump over. It's an enormous hurdle. Right? Are you the one that is to come? Is Jesus really the Son of God? Is he really the Messiah? Because if he is, why is all there this disaster in the world? I thought he was supposed to come and save everybody. But he did, but it wasn't our expectation. It didn't happen the way that we thought it was going to happen. See, the reality is, is we care more about physical things and God cares more about the spiritual things. Why? Because the physical will burn and die and turn back into dust where the, spi the, the, the spiritual form will live forever. Did that make sense? So the reality is, is, what do you care more about? Your physical or your spiritual? And the reality becomes... Most of us like our physical more than we like our spiritual. We'll do everything that we can to fight for our, our physical, and we always lack in our spiritual development. So the question really becomes, what were you expecting when you, when you accepted Christ? Because that's going to determine in what category you're going to fall in. And the reality starts to become, if I believe the scriptures wholeheartedly, that I know exactly who Jesus is. That I know that, guess what, sometimes I'm going to go through hard times. But it's not God's fault. There might be lessons I need to learn. Or there might be something that's going on that I, I'll get to connect with some people. And that might be the reason. I don't know. And I'll never know until I get in front of him and say, Hey, remember that one, you know, decade? <laughs> <laughs> see the people that are now coming to me because of you. Amen. See, it's not about me and my physical, it's about them and their spiritual. Yeah? No? Yeah. This next thing, I, I, there's another concept with this. Our, our, expect, our expectations blind us to God's kingdom reality and leave us questioning God's goodness and purpose. You think about that? It's true. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Are, our expectations blind us to God's kingdom reality, or his kingdom, and leave us questioning God's goodness and purpose. See, if we have a different expectation than what God is trying to do, then we, we, we are left wondering about God's goodness. Did that make sense? And his purpose in the earth. Yes? Golden? Second question I have. The second question we need to answer is, what are you running from? I don't care how old you are in this room right now. We all run from something. There's always something that we're trying to get away from. Does that make sense? There are always things in our lives that we are trying to move past or we are trying to ignore and that type of stuff. So the comment becomes running, okay? And this is where you get church hoppers from and all that kind of stuff as well, you know, where they go from one church to the next church because they can't really figure out church. And, oh, well, this person over here, they, they, they hurt me because they said this about me. And so forget that entire church. That whole church must be evil. So I'm going to go to this church. And then all of a sudden they go to somebody here at this church. And they find out that, oh, well, they said something bad too. And so they leave church and they go to, yeah. yeah. 
And if you're here because of that, hi, welcome. I'd <laughs> love to have you. Uh, but we ain't perfect. Somebody's going to say something about you, and you're not going to like it, or we're not going to do the right thing, or we're going to say something from the pulpit that offends you. And, and the reality is, it's just the way it is, because human, humans are involved. And so the, the question becomes, when are you going to stop running? When are you just going to start to start to deal with some of the things that are going on in your life? Because life is not always fair. And there's hard things in life. And here's what happens when we start to run. And, and because we get this idea that if I run long enough and I run fast enough, it will disappear. <laughs> the problem will just fade away. And that's not the truth. So here's my, here is my concept with this. Is it says, uh, running will never solve an issue or situation. It just prolongs the inevitable and distracts us from our calling and purpose. Yes? So this is what happens when we start getting into these type of things. Every so with me? So here's the result of that. Ready? The faster we come to reconciliation over the issue or situation, the faster God can get back to using us to our full potential. Okay? So when we decide to stop running, we can start moving forward in our calling <coughs> and in our purpose. Everybody's still hanging out with me. Are you sure? Yes. So I know you want a scripture. So, because we've got to make this biblical. Right? You can't just have these thought processes and not have the, the, the scripture to back it up. So here's the, here's the situation that's going on in 1 Samuel. Uh, it, I'll read it to you. One day Jonathan, the son of Saul, which means he's the prince of Israel. Did you guys catch that? Yes. Jonathan is the prince of Israel. Okay, uh, Said to the younger man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistine's garrison on the other side. Okay, But he did not tell his father. Now some of you guys are like, what is the Philistine garrison? What are you talking about? There are two mountains that are at play right now, and the Philistines own everything except for ba or, or basically uh, they own everything that's going on. Matter of fact, there are no weapons. They stole all the weapons from Israel. There are two swords in Israel at this point in time. Jonathan has one, and his dad has one. That is what they said. Now, they literally, if they have like any axes or anything like that to do farming, they have to actually go into the Philistine-like camp and actually ask them to sharpen their tools. Are you guys with me on this one? So if they want anything sharpened to do their work, and then what do you think the Philistines did? Oh yeah, this is going to be cheap. Oh no, you're from Israel? Oh yeah, this is going to be a $5 job and now a $25 job. Does that make sense? Well, that's not fair. You're right, it's not, but I do what I want. Does that make sense? They're sitting there for months. It's like a stalemate. The Philistines won't come in and get them, and, and, and Israel won't go and attack them. So they're like at this stalemate. And every time, that, every day that they stall out, they're losing weapons, they're losing people. Like, it's getting tiresome. And so Jonathan just gets up one day and he says, hey, let's just go over there. Now, he doesn't say, hey, let's bring in the entire army. He looks at his armor bearer, because he has a big job right now, since he only has to carry a sword, right? Um, he looks over at him and he goes, hey, let's go to the Philistine camp. Let's see what's going on. Right? Okay? But they didn't tell his father. So they just said, oh, wait, go back. Okay? It says, Jonathan said this is young man to carry his armor. Come, let's go over to the garrison. It may be that the Lord... I know, you just like how to run past that. <laughs> Let me get no spoilers. Um, I lost my spot. Okay. Uh, may it be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving uh, by, by many or by few. Here's what's happening. Israel's not pushing in because they're afraid. They don't want to run in. They don't want to do anything. So they're running, literally, even though they're at a stalemate, they're technically running from the Philistines because they don't believe that they can beat the Philistines. Are you with me on that one? So they're kind of hiding from the Philistines more than they're doing anything else. And Jonathan gets this point and looks over his armor and goes, let's go over there. Because listen, either God's going to save us with the two of us, or God's not going to save us at all. We're going to die and we're all going to figure this out. But at least I don't have to sit in this mountain anymore. Good. You ever get into a spot like that? God, it's either you show up or you kill me. Because either way, I'm good. Right? And this is where Jonathan's at. And I, I just love, like, his armor bearer is like the man here. And, and this is, I, it reminds me of the way the church should be. This just reminds me of the way the church should be. And his armor bearer said to him, do all that is in your heart. Do as you wish. Behold, I am with you, heart and soul, says the guy that's running into battle without a sword. 
Think about that. I'm with you. If this is the relationship the church should have with every single one of its congregation members. We are just running. We're like, woo! Either God's going to destroy us or we're going to be like, it's going to be awesome. But either way, we're going. You want to come? And now you, hopefully the congregation goes, do all that is in your heart. Do as you wish. We hold that with your heart and soul. Why? Because if we're going to go, we're going to do this together. We're going to go fight together. And then I just love what happens. And then John said, behold, we will cross over uh, to the men and we will show ourselves to them. And if they say to us, wait until we come to you, then we will stand in our place and we will not go up. Uh, and we will not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, then we will go up to them for the Lord has given them into our hands and this shall be uh, the sign to us. What does that mean? Basically, they said this. We're going to go up to them and we're going to be like, hi! And if they look at us and say, hey, we're coming down there, then we're going to die. So, it was fun hanging out. <laughs> but if they say to us, hey, get up here, then we know that the Lord has delivered them into our hands and then we fight. Does that make sense? Either way, we might die. Are you cool? <laughs> Let's do this! <laughs> Notice how Jonathan the Elder Bird stopped running. The situation would have never been resolved if they kept running and hiding. You have to stand your ground at some point and say either God is for me or God's against me. And you cannot be scared of the results. Did that make sense? We've just got to move. Now, what happened? If you guys want to know the rest of the story, you should read it. It's in First Samuel, chapter 14. It's really good. Um, but I really didn't tell you. So, uh, the last question. The last question is this. When will you believe slash trust? So, question one, what are you expecting? What did you expect from God when you decided to do this? Number two, what are you really running from? Because you're never going to be able to settle and really find God and start to build a relationship if you're still running from things. Whether you're running from God, from your family, from your past, whatever you're running from, you need to kind of get to it. And the last thing is this, is when will you actually start to believe and start to trust? And notice I didn't put what afterwards. Because let's just be real. When are you going to start trusting and believing? God, people, the Bible. I mean, there's a, there's a list of things that we can put behind there. Does that make sense? And the reality is, is we got to get to a place where we're sitting back and we're saying, I actually start to believe this, and I actually start to, I am starting to trust this. And here was my thought process on this. So you guys can. You can hear about Christ all day long. You can even go to church every Sunday. But unless you invite the Lord to dwell with you, you will never see who he truly is or who you, you were truly meant to be. Listen, you go to church and hear about this stuff all day long. Matter of fact, we know about Samuel. In, in chapter 1 of Samuel, it says that he lived in the temple, he hung out in the temple, and he knew the word of God, but he actually didn't know God. Did that make sense? So the reality is for you guys, when are you guys going to stop running? And when you stop, when are you actually going to say, God, I actually believe you and I trust you and I need you here? Because that's when he shows up. It's almost like we want to play this game like, can you catch me now? Can you catch me now? And God's just like, you know what? I'm just going to let you tire yourself out. And I, let's just be real. God has this relationship. He, we call, we're called his children, right? Which means he's our father. And if you have little kids at your house, you know this. If you want them to take a nap and you need them to rest, you don't follow them. You just let them run around until they get really tired and fall down. <laughs> Does that make sense? Right? It's easy to be laughing. Some of you guys know what it's like. You just go, 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 go. You know, and then all of a sudden it's like, they go, hey, I'm tired. Can I just hang out with you? And that's what happens. They want to crawl up into your lap. And they just want to hang out with you. And they want to snuggle with you. Does that make sense? And that says to God, God's just sitting back going, when are you going to just get tired of running? And when are you just going to want to take a rest? And when you're going to take a rest, come up into my arms. Because I'm ready. Does that mean, yeah? But we have to start believing. We have to take a chance to stop. And to, here's the next part of that. Um, how do you know you've laid down your expectations, you've stopped running, and you truly believe and trust? Because the world will look completely new to you. 
Now, some of us, we don't get this. Some of us, we don't have this concept in our, in our brains because the world still looks the same as, if, as when we accepted Jesus Christ. If that's the case, ask these questions. If that's the case, find out where you're at. I'm, I'm like, are you a follower? Are you a hypocrite? Or do you believe in some God that really doesn't exist? And you have to ask yourself these things. Because when you start getting into these things, you have to start recognizing a few things in your own life and start to fix them. Does that make sense? What does it mean that the world looks new to you? Remember that neighbor that was super annoying? Not so annoying anymore. Why? Because you care more about his salvation and you care more about his spiritual nature than what he's actually trying to do to you. And that goes with every co-worker, every person that won't let you over on the freeway. <laughs> it goes to everybody. Does this make sense? The world starts to look different to you. But I have to share this last thing, and then the band can come on. Uh, I want to share this one thing real quick. Um, the problem that starts to become in churches, we have a disconnect. Because you think you're supposed to act one way to the world, and you're not actually supposed to act that way to the world. And you're like, what do you mean? Good. I'm going I'm to show you. Colossians. Okay? Colossians 3, 1 through 15. It's kind of a little bit longer, but I want you to hear this because I think you're going to see that, oh yeah, that's how you're supposed to act as a Christian, but it's, it, watch. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven. What do you do when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? You stop running, you have all these expectations, you lay it down, you're actually a follower of Christ. Whose realities do we live under? Heavens. That means heaven's reality mixes here with us today. Does this make sense? This is where you're like, well, what does that mean? Well, that means uh, healings and all those kind of things. There will be no more tears. There will be no more this. The realities of heaven have to start to blend with earth, and at least into our lifestyle. Did that make sense? Because that's, that's what we're saying here. So when you've been raised in your life with Christ, you set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. Uh-oh. How many times are we sitting down and we're worried about money and we're worried about things of the world and we don't actually sit down and think about the things of God and His kingdom reality? Does that make sense? We've got to learn. We have to train ourselves to start thinking of the things of heaven. For you died uh, to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, um, who is your life, and when Christ, who is... Notice your life is no longer your own. It's His is revealed to the whole world. You will share in all his glory. So put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual morality, impurity, lust, the evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. Oh, yay, anger of God, yay. No, I'm just making sure you're with me. Okay, verse 7. You used to do these things when your life was still a part of this world. If you're still doing these things, you're still a part of the world. And I didn't say it. He said it. Does this make sense? I'm not condemning you. I'm not saying anything. But this is the truth. The reality is, is we have a different lifestyle. We have a different way of life. Okay? And, and it goes on to say, but now is the time to get rid of Anger, rage, malice, behavior, malice, mal let me try that again. Anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and obscene language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off the old sinful nature and it is and, and all its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed, be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew, a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, no laughing. Okay, barbaric, uncivilized. <laughs> Whatever. Okay? Slave or free. Christ is all that matters, and he lives in all of us. Since God chose you to be the holy people, holy means set apart, in case you were wondering. The holy people, the set apart people he loves, you must clothe yourself with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Uh, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive one another, uh, one another who offends you. When you read that, you think that's how you're supposed to act, right? Isn't that how you're supposed to act? Yes. Who is he talking to, though? 
To those that believe in who? To God. Right? They believe in God. They're Christ followers. They understand this. Did you notice how the church is supposed to act towards each other? The problem is when we read this, we think we're supposed to act like this to everybody in the world that doesn't know God. Did you catch that? When you start acting like that to everybody that doesn't know God, all of a sudden you, you, you water down the gospel and they don't understand why they have to actually believe what you believe because they can keep doing the things that, you, that they're doing and there's no offense. Did that make sense? This is not for the entire world. This is actually for the church to act with, with one another in the church. So if somebody outside the church comes and sins against me, I'm like, oh no, it's okay, I forgive you, you're good. Well, are they going to keep doing it? Absolutely they're going to keep doing it. Why? Because that guy's winky, I can do whatever I want. The reality is I need to stop them and say, whoa, time out, you don't get to do this to me. Why? Because I'm royalty and you're not right now. Keep the reality. This is where I live. They don't live there yet. So guess what? I have to bring something to them that says, why are you living while you're living? I'm not going to let you keep doing this to me. Oh, you're a Christian. I thought you're supposed to be nice. No, I'm supposed to be nice to people that are inside the church that care about me, who love me. You don't care about me. You don't love me. But you know what? I want to show you some mercy a little bit. And I'm going to tell you if I can get you to come to church because I know you need to have this in your life. Because the people you hang around with, they ain't giving you that. Yeah. Do you understand now why people should come to church? To be around people that understand this love. Now, are you ready for this? They might come in here and they might see how we love each other and how we're tender hearted and we have mercy and we have patience with each other. Are you guys with me on this one? Right? And the reality starts to become they see that and they want it. It's our lifestyle. My friends don't give me that. Yeah, there's something special here. No, it's not special. This is normal in God's kingdom. Does that make sense? His reality. I'll stop there. The last thing is this. Kind of the last thought process, if you will. Go ahead and go to the next. Bam, you can come on stage. Next one. Yes. This is the thing that we should always start to remember. Okay? God has delivered us on the cross from the penalty of sin. Right? I am being delivered from the practice of sin. That's what's happening now. Right? And the last thing is, I shall be delivered from the presence of sin, which is when I... Die. I get um, transformed, taken, whatever. <laughs> Beamed up, Scotty. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> so here's where, where are we supposed to live? After hearing all of this stuff, where are we supposed to live? Then? Well, it's very simple. We know we have that forgiveness because the penalty of sin is gone. Who's the penalty of sin gone for? every single person on the planet. It's gone. That's not what gets you into heaven. What gets you into heaven is your practice. Why? Because I'm trying every day to follow God as much as I can. I'm trying to get into his word. I'm sitting there and I'm like, God, what do you want from me? What do you need me to do? And I'm building a relationship with God. Because that relationship with God means this. When I stand in front of him in heaven, he'll know my voice. I'll know his voice. And he'll be like, Craig, I've been waiting for you. Just like a long lost friend would. Does that make sense? That's where relationship comes into play. And the last thing is this. You are going to be in the presence of sin your entire life. It doesn't mean that you have to sin. It means that you are in its presence. And it has an effect, whether it's happening to you or you're doing it. Does that make sense? One day we will have a release of that. And that's the hope. That becomes the hope that one day I won't have to deal with everybody else's messes. That I, I don't have to be hurt by everybody else's sins. I don't have to worry about offense. I don't have to do it. Why? Because it's gone. And that's the hope of, of heaven. That one day I'll get to live there. So the questions that I asked you today were, were simple. But it takes your actions. So, where do you live? Are you a follower? Are you the hypocrite? Or do you have to reevaluate the God that you serve? Because it's not a God at all. It's something that you've made up. You do that through your expectations. What are you expecting? Two, what are you running from? And three, when will you truly start to believe and trust in the Lord? Amen? Father, would you love on your sons and daughters? 
God, I just want to say thank you for this time. Thank you for your presence, God, in this room. And I, God, I pray, God, as, as this was being said, God, that it started to shape us, Lord, to who you've called us to be. So, God, we want to worship you now because you deserve to be worshipped. And, God, we want to do it with kingdom or not. We ask this in your name.